Well, the system we now know is capitalism. That is to say that it was not only the African slave trade, but the allied businesses attached to the African slave trade. Banking, insurance, shipping. As I point out in the book, in Georgia and South Carolina, in order to gain access to oftentimes isolated plantations to foil slave revolts, roads and ferries had to be built, which not only had the advantage of being able to transport militias to these sites, but also could lead to a leap in the productive forces of those local economies. So this African slave trade was very important to the development of the North Atlantic community, not only the enterprises in England and Britain, but also here in North America. But the contradictory impulse is that it also leads to slave revolts. Uh, that is to say that uh, in the Caribbean in particular, in Antigua, 1709-1736, in Jamaica, with the Maroons in the 1730s and the 1740s, the Africans were on the rampage. And given the fact that oftentimes they outnumbered the Europeans, sometimes 20 to 1, this was creating favorable conditions for slave revolts. At the same time, Britain was not operating in this hemisphere alone. There were other European powers, not least of which was Spain, which was just across the border from Georgia and Spanish Florida. For various reasons that need not detain us here, as early as the 1500s, Spain had been arming Africans. And those Africans oftentimes were coming across the border into South Carolina to pillage, plunder, and act as marauders, which, by the way, is helping to contribute to gathering anti African sentiment amongst the settler class, particularly in South Carolina. Now, what's ironic, and particularly about our presence here in Georgia, is that those of you who grew up in Atlanta may recall from your, hopefully you recall, when you were taught in your schools, <laughs> that Georgia was started in 1733 as supposedly an all-white colony, so-called. No Africans allowed. This was due in part to the fact that the purpose of Georgia was to be something of a Berlin Wall, separating Spanish Florida from South Carolina in the prize that was Virginia, which in that day was the California of the colonies, that was the richest, uh, for example, not least because of the African slave trade. But as the fact that the 2010 census suggested that the now state of Georgia may have more people of African descent than any other state in the United States of America, obviously the all white colony idea didn't work out very well. And it didn't work out very well for another. First of all, I should mention that one of the reasons why London desired all so-called all-white colonies was because the Africans were seen as being more favorable to Spain than they were to London. I should also say that this was putting competitive pressure on London to act like Spain. That is to say, put arms in the hands of the Africans. But putting arms in the hands of the Africans was enraging, the very idea was enraging the settlers who did not contemplate arming Africans, they contemplated manacling and enslaving every African in sight so they could be forced at virtual gunpoint to work in the tobacco fields and serve massa in the big house. Yeah, so the Europeans didn't want to work in the field, it's very hard labor. Uh, the North American settlers were notorious for the smuggling talents didn't take them long to start smuggling Africans into Georgia. But also, if you had an all-white colony, that basically complicated the idea of the whiteness because of many class contradictions amongst the European settlers. That's to say, some working in the field, some in the big house. And that was replicating the kinds of class contradictions that many across the Atlantic to escape. In many ways, you needed this other population, uh, not only indigenous, but Africans, in order to weld together this rather unwieldy category of that, that was whiteness. In any case, as London is being pressured to act like uh, Spain in particular and arm Africans, this is enraging the settler class. Uh, the fact that the Africans armed by Spain are coming across the border to push uh, obviously puts pressure on London to do something about 
about this. So finally, another factoid from your K-12 classes, you might recall there was something called the Seven Years' War, 1756 to 1763, uh, where London was dis designing on expelling the Spanish from Florida, which they basically did, and expelling the French, the other capital power, from Quebec. That is to say that what was going on was taking place in the context of the so-called religious war between Protestant London and the so-called capital powers, uh, Spain and France in the first place. Now we get to the part where I'm sure that your K-12 history classes will begin to assert itself. Because after London had expelled the Spanish from Florida and the French from Quebec, they wanted to impose taxes upon the settlers to pay for this enterprise which was to their benefit. But the settlers were opposed to that. And that brings us to Lord Mansfield, a leading character in this particular film, Bell, because Lord Mansfield had before him in the early 1770s, not long after the end of the Seven Years' War, a case that led to his saying that slavery in England could no longer obtain. Uh, the settlers here came quickly and perhaps logically to the conclusion that if slavery could not obtain in England and London was ruling the colonies, well then it would not take long for that decision to cross the Atlantic and suggest that abolition of slavery was coming to the colonies, which would jeopardize the fortunes of many of those who rose as one in 1776 to expel them. That. That's to say, the people who, if you look at your wallet, you'll find pictures. George Washington, for example, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Patrick Henry, slave owners, and what all. So they arrive, they rise up, cast out on London, and of course this lofty rhetoric of students about the, their liberty and freedom being at stake. But as I argue in this book, what's really at stake is their liberty and freedom to enslave Africans, which is one of the reasons why after they expelled London and established the United States of America, they also expelled London from the leadership of the international slave trade. They leveraged this gargantuan market for enslaved Africans here in North America to take over the market in Cuba, to eventually take over the market in the great prize that is Brazil by the 1830s, thereby creating these fantastic fortunes which helped to create this superpower now known as the United States of America. Now let me just say in closing that I don't feel that it's irrelevant that a large mass field is of Scottish origin. That is to say that Scotland had only come into the Union, the United Kingdom, England, Wales, etc., in 1707. There was always residents in Scotland. And one can make an argument that the empire was heavily dependent upon Scots as administrators and as colonial governors and bureaucrats and the like, and therefore we're going to make an argument that after the empire had disintegrated after the end of World War II, it would not take long, as we will now find out in about 35 days, for Scotland to decide it's going to become an independent country, seceding from the United Kingdom, which will have an enormous impact on our lives here, given the fact that the United Kingdom has been such a staunch ally of the United States, not least in this war mongering enterprises in places like Iraq. Interestingly enough, at the same time, you can make the same argument about the Spanish Empire, that it was heavily dependent upon a region that's analogous to Scotland, speaking Catalonia. And interestingly enough, there will also be a referendum to Catalonia in about a month to six weeks, but Catalonia perhaps seceding to Spain, which also will be very impactful on U.S. foreign policy in our lives here. I should also say that uh, in this movie, and I already told our wonderful director this, <laughs> that there's a character, a senior actor's son, 
whole, in some ways, is the building of the piece. And at a turning point in this particular film, he physically assaults our main lady. Very interesting scene. But what I took away from that scene was that that senior Ashford's son would be the person in Great Britain most likely to migrate to a place like Georgia and become a U.S. captain so he could have the right to continue manhandling women of color and enslaving them in the worst case or doing something worse in the absolute worst case. And that is one of the scenes which makes this movie something that all of us should see and must thank you very much.